On the 24th of May, 1863, the famous mineralogist Professor Lidenbrock, my uncle, came rushing back towards his little house in the old quarter of Hamburg. I was getting ready to beat a prudent retreat. When passing through the dining room, he rushed straight into his study, flinging his stick and his broad-brimmed hat onto the table. Axel, follow. Well, haven't you got here yet? Otto Lidenbrock was a terrible eccentric. A tall, thin man who enjoyed excellent health, big eyes constantly rolling behind huge spectacles, and a long, thin nose like the blade of a knife. The household in the Königstrasse included his goddaughter, 17-year-old Graben, our good servant Martha, and myself, his laboratory assistant. This, then, was the gentleman who was calling me so impatiently. With such an eccentric character, obedience was the only course to adopt. I therefore rushed into his study. As I entered, my uncle was holding a book which he was considering with the profoundest admiration. What a book! It's a priceless treasure that I found this morning. Isn't it beautiful? And what a binding! Not a single crack after 700 years. It's the Heims Klingler of Schnorro Tulsen, the famous Icelandic writer of the 12th century. It is the chronicle of the Norwegian princes who ruled over Iceland. Really? I said. Is it a translation? What would I be doing with a translation? This is the original work in Icelandic. Ah, and is the type good? Type? Who said anything about type? It's a manuscript, you idiot, a runic manuscript. The runes were letters of an alphabet used in Icelandic in olden times. Legend has it that they were invented by Odin himself. Look at them, irreverent boy and admire these characters sprung from a god's imagination. Then a little incident occurred, which changed the course of the conversation. A dirty piece of parchment slipped out of the book and fell on the floor. My uncle pounced upon the fragment. He carefully unfolded a piece of parchment, five inches by three, containing a few lines of unintelligible characters. Look! These are runic letters. They are absolutely identical with those in Schnorro Tulsen's manuscript. But what on earth do they mean? It's definitely runic. But there's a secret to it, which I mean to discover. Sit down there and get ready to write. Now, I am going to dictate to you the letters of our alphabet which correspond to these Icelandic characters. As the letters were called out one after another, they formed an incomprehensible succession of words. My uncle snatched up the paper and examined it closely for a long time. To think that I may have here the clue to some great discovery, he said thoughtfully. But the cryptogram is of a later date than the book. There are at least 200 years between the book and the document. I think that one of the owners of this book wrote these mysterious letters. But who the devil was that owner? My uncle raised his spectacles, picked up a powerful magnifying glass, and carefully examined the first page of the book. On the back of the second page, the one bearing the subtitle, he noticed a sort of stain which looked like a blot of ink. He laboured at the stain until, with the help of his magnifying glass, he ended up by distinguishing runic characters. Arne Saknusem. Why, that's an Icelandic name. He was a famous alchemist of the 16th century. I am going to discover the secret of this document, and I shall neither eat nor sleep until I have guessed it. Nor will you, Axel. First of all, we must find the key to this cipher. This Sagnusum would naturally write in Latin. But what is that key? Axel, have you any idea? I made no reply. My eyes had fallen on a charming picture hanging on the wall, the portrait of Grauben. My uncle's pretty ward and I loved each other. We had become engaged, unknown to my uncle, who was too deeply absorbed in his geology to understand such feelings as ours. My uncle, thumping the table with his fist, brought me abruptly back to earth. Look here. Write the words vertically instead of horizontally. Now let's see how that works. Axel? Write down any sentence that comes into your head on this scrap of paper. Only put them in vertical columns. 
so as to get five or six lines of letters. Now, to read the sentences, all I need to do is to take the first letter of each word, then the second letter, and so on. And my uncle, to his great surprise, and even more to mine, read out, I love you very much, my dear little Graben. Ah! So you are in love with Graben. Well, now, let's apply my method to the document in question. He gave a loud cough, and in a solemn voice, he read out the first letter of each word, then the second, and so on. He dictated a series of letters in groups which made no sense to me, but I expected the professor to pronounce a magnificent Latin sentence. To my astonishment, a violent blow from his fist made the table rock on its legs. That can't be it, exclaimed my uncle. It doesn't make sense. Then he rushed out into the Königstrasse and disappeared as fast as his legs would carry him. Has he gone? cried Martha, running out of her kitchen. Yes, I replied, well and truly gone. Well, and what about his dinner? Martha, he's not going to eat a thing, nor is anybody else in this house. Uncle Lidenbrock is going to starve us all until he's succeeded in deciphering an indecipherable old scrawl. The old servant, seriously alarmed, went back to her kitchen. I picked up the sheet of paper. What can it possibly mean? I asked myself. My brain became heated. My eyes blinked at the sheet of paper, and the 132 letters seemed to flutter around me. I was stifling. I needed air. Without thinking, I started fanning myself with the sheet of paper, so that the back and the front came alternately before my eyes. Imagine my surprise when, in one of these rapid movements, just as the back was turning towards me, I thought I could see some perfectly legible words. Latin words, such as craterum and terrestre. Light suddenly dawned upon me. I bent over the table and placed my finger on each letter in succession. And without stopping, without hesitating for a moment, I read out the whole sentence. At first, I was absolutely thunderstruck. Had what I had just read really happened? Had some man had the audacity to penetrate... Oh, no. If my uncle got to hear of a journey of this sort, he would want to follow suit. He would set off in spite of everything. And he would take me with him. And we should never come back. Never. Never. The only thing to do was to destroy the document. I picked up not only the sheet of paper, but also Sacknusum's parchment. And I was about to fling them both into the fire when the study door opened and my uncle appeared. I only just had time to put the wretched document back on the table. Professor Lidenbrock seemed preoccupied. His all-absorbing idea was not giving him a moment's rest. When I awoke next morning, he was still at work. With a single word, I could have loosened the pressure of that iron vice which was squeezing his brain. But I said nothing. In my uncle's own best interests, I was determined to keep the secret which chance had revealed to me. Two o'clock struck. I began to feel really hungry. I started telling myself that my uncle would not believe it. He would dismiss it as a joke, that eventually he would find the key to the cipher himself. I resolved to tell all. Uncle Lidenbrock, I have found the key to the document. Read that. But it's meaningless, said the professor. Yes, if you start reading at the beginning, but if you read backwards... The professor uttered a cry of amazement. He read the whole document, translating as he read, Descend into the crater of Schneffel's Jokul, over which the shadow of Scataris falls before the calends of July, bold traveller, and you will reach the centre of the earth. I have done this. Arne Saknusem. After a few moments of silence, my uncle asked, What time is it? Three o'clock. Is it really? I'm dying of hunger. Let's have something to eat. After that, you can pack my box. What? And your own. 
At these words, a shudder went through the whole of my body. I knew that only scientific arguments could stop Professor Lidenbrock. To go to the center of the earth. What a crazy idea. Axel, you have done me a great service. I shall never forget that, my boy, and you shall have your share in the glory we are going to win. Above all, I insist on absolute secrecy. If this document were made public, a whole army of geologists would rush to follow in Arne Saknosum's footsteps. Yes, I said. I grant you that Saknosum wrote those lines, but does it follow that he really performed the journey? May not this old parchment be just a hoax? You are perfectly free to express your opinion, Axel. I no longer regard you as my nephew, but as my colleague. Go on. Well, first I should like to ask you what these names Jokul, Schneffels and Skataris mean. Ah, now here is one of the best maps of Iceland. You can see that there are volcanoes all over the island and they all bear the name Jokul. I see. But what is Schneffels? Follow my finger along the west coast of Iceland. You see Reykjavik, the capital? Good. Well, just below the 65th degree of latitude, what do you see there? A mountain. That is Schneffels. It is 5,000 feet high and undoubtedly destined to be the most famous in the world, if its crater leads to the center of the globe. That's impossible, I retorted. Impossible? And why should it be impossible? Because the crater must be full of lava and burning rocks, and in that case, but what if it is an extinct volcano? Extinct? Well, that is possible. But what does Scataris mean? And where do the calends of July come into all this? What is obscure to you is crystal clear to me. Schneffels has several craters, and it was therefore necessary to indicate the one which leads to the center of the Earth. Sacknusum observed that at the approach of the calends of July, one of the peaks of the mountain, Scartaris, cast its shadow as far as the mouth of the crater in question. I saw that I could not shake my uncle as far as the words on the old parchment were concerned. All right. Sacknusum went to the bottom of Schneffels. He saw the shadow of Scartaris touch the edge of the crater before the calends of July. He even heard tell in the legendary stories of his day that the crater led to the centre of the earth. But as for his having gone down there and come back alive, no, a hundred times no. And why not? Because all the theories of science prove that a feat of that sort is impossible. The temperature at the centre must be over two million degrees. Consequently, all the substances inside the earth must be in a state of incandescent gas. How could it be possible to penetrate so far? Neither you nor anybody else knows for certain what is going on inside the Earth, seeing that we have penetrated only about one twelve thousandth part of its radius. Axel, the state of the terrestrial nucleus has given rise to a variety of theories among geologists. Nothing is less certain than the existence of that internal heat you believe in. My own view is that it doesn't exist and couldn't possibly exist. But in any case, we shall see for ourselves, like Arne Sacknussen. <laughs> I needed fresh air and went out to the banks of the Elbe. Had I been listening to the mad speculations of a lunatic or to the scientific conclusions of a genius? Where in all this did truth stop and error begin? After some while, I caught sight of Grauben walking briskly towards Hamburg. Axel, what's the matter? she asked. Three sentences were sufficient to put her in possession of the facts. Axel, she said at last, it will be a wonderful journey, a journey worthy of a scientist's nephew. Oh, how hard it is to understand the hearts of women. Reason has no part in their lives. This girl was encouraging me to take part in that expedition and would not have been afraid to join it herself. I was disconcerted and, to tell the truth, ashamed of myself. Grauben, I said, we shall see whether you talk like this tomorrow. Tomorrow, my dear Axel, I shall speak exactly as I have done today. So we continued on our way, tired out by the day's emotions. I comforted myself with the thought that the calends of July were still a long way off, and that a great many things could happen in the meantime to cure my uncle of his mania for underground exploration. But I had reckoned without the professor's impatience. 
Come along, Axel, exclaimed my uncle as soon as he saw me. Hurry up! Your box isn't packed, my papers aren't in order, and I can't find the key to my bag. Uh, are we going, then? Yes. First thing tomorrow. Have you any doubts? No. Only I don't see what need there is to hurry. Think of time. Time flying with irreparable speed. But it's only the 26th of May, and from now until the end of June. If we delay, we should arrive too late to see the shadow of Scataris touch the crater of Schneffels. So we have to get to Copenhagen as fast as we can to find some means of transport to Iceland. Go and pack your things. I'll see you tomorrow morning. We leave at six, sharp. I couldn't bear any more. I fled upstairs to my room and slumped onto my bed. During the night, fear took hold of me. I felt the professor's strong hand gripping me, dragging me along, pulling me into chasms and quicksands. I kept hurtling into bottomless abysses with the increasing velocity of bodies dropping through space. My life had become an interminable fall. I awoke at five, worn out with fatigue and emotion. I went down to the dining room. My uncle was at table, eating a hearty breakfast. Grauben was there. I couldn't eat anything. At half past five, there was a rumble of wheels outside. A carriage had arrived. It was now obviously impossible to fight against my fate. At that moment, my uncle was solemnly handing over the reins of the house to Grauben. She couldn't restrain a tear as she kissed my cheek. Martha and Grauben waved a final farewell. Then the two horses set off at a gallop along the road to Hamburg and the terminus of the Kiel Railway. At seven o'clock, we were sitting opposite each other in our compartment. The whistle sounded and the engine moved off. We were on our way. I noticed the precious document carefully tucked away in the innermost pocket of my uncle's wallet. I cursed it from the bottom of my heart and turned my attention to the countryside. Three hours after our departure, the train stopped at Kiel, a stone's throw from the sea. As our luggage was registered for Copenhagen, we had no need to bother about it. But the professor watched it anxiously as it was transferred to the steamer. At ten the following morning, we disembarked in Copenhagen. We scoured the quays in search of a ship leaving for Iceland. I hoped against hope that there would be no means of transport. But I was disappointed. A little Danish schooner, the Valkyrie, was shortly due to set sail for Reykjavik. Come aboard! said Captain Jarni, after pocketing a respectable number of krona. Things are going very well, very well indeed, said my uncle. What a stroke of luck to find this boat ready to sail. Now, let's have some breakfast. So on the 2nd of June at 6 in the morning, our precious luggage was taken on board the Valkyrie. Is the wind favourable? asked my uncle. Couldn't be better, replied Captain Yarney. It's a sou'easter. We shall leave the sound at full speed with all sails set. Soon our schooner encountered the great Atlantic swell. She had to tack against the north wind and reached the Faroes only with some difficulty. The voyage passed without incident. I bore the trials of the sea fairly well. My uncle, to his great annoyance and even greater shame, was sick from beginning to end. Fourteen days after leaving Copenhagen, we sighted the beacon of Cape Skagen. An Icelandic pilot came on board, and three hours later, the Valkyrie anchored off Reykjavik. The professor at last emerged from his cabin, somewhat pale and haggard, but as enthusiastic as ever. Before leaving the deck of the schooner, he dragged me forward and pointed out to me to the north of the bay a high mountain with a double peak covered with perpetual snow. Schneffels! Schneffels! 
We were carrying an introduction to a Mr. Friedrichsen, a local schoolmaster and, like my uncle, a geologist. For a few days we were his guests while we assembled our provisions and instruments. Only too soon I heard my uncle say to our host, Now we are ready and I must see about getting a guide. I have one I can offer you, said Friedrichsen. He's an able fellow and I'm sure you'll be pleased with him. When can I see him? Tomorrow, if you like. Why not today? Because he won't be here till tomorrow. Tomorrow, then, said my uncle with a sigh. I slept soundly all night, and when I awoke, I joined my uncle in the next room. He was chatting volubly in Danish with a big strapping fellow who was obviously uncommonly strong. Everything about him indicated a perfectly calm temperament, not indolent, but peaceful. This grave, phlegmatic individual who pursued the gentle profession of collecting the feathers of the eider duck was called Hans Jelke. My uncle wanted to pay the hunter in advance, but he refused with a single word, Efter. A splendid fellow, exclaimed my uncle, but he little knows what a wonderful part he is going to play in the future. So he's coming with us to the center? Yes, Axel, to the center of the earth. The start was fixed for the 16th of June. 48 hours remained until our departure. All our ingenuity was devoted to packing every article to best advantage. One, an idle centigrade thermometer reading up to 150 degrees. Two, a manometer of compressed air to indicate pressures higher than that of the atmosphere at sea level. Three, a chronometer. Four, two compasses, one for inclination, the other for declination. Five, a night glass. Six, two Ruhmkorff coils, which by means of an electric current provided a safe, handy and portable light. Seven, two rifles and two Colt revolvers. Eight, a large quantity of gun cotton, mattocks, pickaxes, a silk rope ladder, three iron shod staves, an axe, a hammer, a dozen iron wedges and spikes, and some long knotted cords. Lastly, there were the provisions. These I found reassuring for I knew that there was enough meat extract and biscuits to last us six months. Six pairs of stout boots, waterproof with a mixture of tar and india rubber, were packed with the tools. Clothed, shod and equipped like this, said my uncle. There's no reason why we shouldn't go a very long way. Now, my boy, get some rest. We start early. At five in the morning, the neighing of four horses pawing on the ground under my window woke me. I dressed quickly and went down into the street. At six o'clock, everything was ready. We mounted our horses, and with a final farewell to Mr. Friedrichsen, we set off under a cloudy but settled sky. A week of hard riding along the coast brought us through the foothills, and then a slow climb with many a pause to cross rivers in full spate finally brought us to the lower slopes of Schneffels. We were skirting the huge base of the volcano. The professor never took his eyes off it, gesticulating as if he were defying it. So, that is the giant I am going to defeat. My uncle was now obliged to explain to the guide that he intended to explore the interior of the volcano as far as he could go. Hans simply nodded his head. To go there or anywhere else, to plunge into the bowels of his island or to cross its surface was all one to him. As for me, I had been distracted by the incidents on our journey and had to some extent forgotten the future. But now... Fear gripped me once again. Uncle, I implored, there's no proof that Schneffels is extinct. Just because the monster has been asleep since, since 1229 doesn't follow that it can never wake up again, and if it does wake up, what will become of us? I have been thinking about that, Axel. Ever since we arrived, I've been pondering over that important question you have just put to me, for we mustn't be imprudent. Schneffels has been silent for 600 years, but it may speak again. Now, eruptions are always preceded by certain well-known phenomena. I have therefore questioned the local inhabitants and examined the ground, and I can assure you, Axel, there will be no eruption. So we began scaling the slopes of Schneffels. By seven in the evening, we had ascended the 2,000 steps of a natural stone staircase which had aided our ascent and we found ourselves on a sort of bulge in the mountain, 
a kind of bed on which the actual cone of the crater rested. The sea stretched away 3,200 feet below. We had passed the perpetual snow line. It was bitterly cold and the wind was blowing hard. I was exhausted. The professor saw that my legs were failing me. Look, he said. From the direction of the plane, a huge column of powdered pumice stone, sand and dust was rising into the air, twisting about like a water spout. The wind was driving it against the side of snow as to which we were clinging. If this column were to bend towards us, we should inevitably be caught up in its eddies. Hasty! Hasty! I understood that we had to follow hands as fast as we could. Fortunately, we had reached the opposite side and were sheltered from the danger as the dust storm fell on the mountain. At last, at 11 o'clock at night, in complete darkness, we reached the summit of Schneffels. And before taking shelter inside the crater, I had time to see the midnight sun at the lowest point of its course, casting its pale rays on the island sleeping at my feet. Next day, we awoke half frozen by the sharp air, but in bright sunshine. I got up from my granite bed and went to enjoy the magnificent spectacle which lay before me. I lost myself in that wonderful ecstasy produced by great peaks. I was intoxicated by the pleasure of altitude, oblivious of the abysses into which my fate was shortly going to plunge me. Hans and the professor joined me on the summit of the peak. We are at the top of Schneffels, and here are two peaks, one to the south and the other to the north. Hans, tell us what the Icelanders call the one on which we are standing now. Skartaris. My uncle shot a triumphant glance at me. Now for the crater, he cried. I imagined the condition of this huge reservoir filled with thunder and flames. To go down into a blunderbuss, I thought, when it may be loaded and may go off at the slightest touch, is sheer lunacy. But there was no going back. By noon, we had arrived at the bottom of the abyss. I raised my head and saw above me the upper aperture of the cone, framing a greatly reduced but almost perfectly circular patch of sky. At one point, only the peak of Scataris stood out, rising into space. At the bottom of the crater, there were three chimneys. I hadn't the courage to look into them, but Professor Lidenbrock had already made a rapid survey of all three. He was panting for breath, running from one to the other, gesticulating and muttering unintelligible words. Suddenly, my uncle gave a shout. I saw him with his arms outstretched and his legs wide apart in front of a granite rock which stood at the centre of the crater. Axel! Axel! he cried. Come here! Come here! Look! On the western face of the block, carved in runic characters, half worn away by time, I saw the name Arne Saknussem. Arne Saknussem! cried my uncle. Have you any doubts now? Overwhelmed by this piece of evidence, I made no reply. The next day, a grey, cloudy, heavy sky settled over the summit of the cone. Hope dawned again in my heart. Of the three ways open to us beneath our feet, only one had been taken by Saknussem. According to the Icelandic scholar, the shadow of Skataris touched the correct one during the last days of June, and on a given day pointed out the way to the centre of the earth. Now, if the sun failed to shine, there would be no shadow and consequently no guide. It was the 25th of June. If the sky would only remain cloudy for six days, the expedition would have to be postponed for another year. On the 26th, there was still no sign. Sleet fell all day. The next day, the sky was still overcast. But on Sunday, the 28th of June, the sun poured its rays into the crater. 
the shadow of Scartaris stood out like a sharp edge and started turning imperceptibly with the sun. My uncle turned with it. At midday, in the shortest period of its course, it gently touched the edge of the central chimney. It's there, cried the professor. It's there, now for the centre of the earth. I looked at Hans. For root, said the guide calmly. Forward, repeated my uncle. It was 13 minutes past one. The real journey was beginning. I had not yet looked down into the bottomless pit into which I was about to plunge. But now the time had come. I could either resign myself to the whole business or refuse to take part in it. I leaned over a projecting rock and looked down. My hair stood on end. The fascination of the void took hold of me. I felt my centre of gravity moving and vertigo rising to my head like intoxication. I was on the point of falling when a hand pulled me back. It was that of Hans. Even so, however brief my examination of the chimney had been, I had seen how it was shaped. Its almost perpendicular walls were covered with countless projections which would facilitate our descent. My uncle uncoiled a rope about as thick as a thumb and 400 feet long. First he let down half of it, then looped it over a projecting block of lava and threw the other half down. By holding on to both halves, each of us could then descend without the rope unwinding. When we were 200 feet down, nothing could be easier than to regain possession of the whole rope by letting go of one end and pulling on the other. This process could be repeated ad infinitum. Hans tied all the non-fragile articles into a single bundle and threw them bodily down the chimney. My uncle, leaning over the abyss, followed the descent of his baggage with a satisfied air. Good, he said. Our turn now. Now I ask any honest man if it was possible to hear those words without a shudder. After half an hour, we had reached the surface of a rock which was firmly attached to the wall of the chimney. Hans pulled one end of the rope, the other rose into the air and, after passing round a projecting rock at the top of the chimney, came down, bringing with it a dangerous sort of rain, or rather hail, of stones and pieces of lava. Leaning over the edge, I observed that the bottom of the hole was still invisible. The manoeuvre with the rope was begun again, and half an hour later, we had descended another 200 feet. The professor was making observations, for at one of our halts he said to me, The farther I go, the more confident I feel. The order of these volcanic formations fully confirms Davy's theory. We are in the middle of the primordial stratum, in which the chemical operation took place of metals catching fire at the contact of air and water. I absolutely reject the idea of central heat. In any case, we shall soon see. After three hours, I still couldn't see the bottom of the chimney, and it was getting gradually darker. Still we kept on descending. We had started at one o'clock, and had been descending for ten hours. As for the depth we had reached, 14 operations with a rope 200 feet long totaled 2,800 feet. At that moment, the professor called out, Halt! We have arrived. Where? At the bottom of the perpendicular chimney. Isn't there any other way out then? Yes. And I can just make out a sort of corridor slanting away to the right. We shall see about that tomorrow. Let's have our supper first and then sleep. Lying on my back, I saw a bright point of light at the end of a 3,000-foot tube, which acted like a gigantic telescope. It was a star which must have been B. Ursa Minor. Then I fell into a deep sleep. At eight in the morning, a ray of daylight woke us up. The countless facets of the lava walls caught it as it passed and scattered it like a shower of sparks. This light was bright enough to enable us to distinguish surrounding objects. Breakfast over, my uncle took out of his pocket a little notebook. 
he consulted his various instruments one after another and recorded the following data. Monday, 29th of June. Chronometer, 8.17 a.m. Barometer, 29 inches, 7 lines. Thermometer, 6 degrees centigrade. Direction, east-southeast. Now, Axel, we are really going to plunge into the bowels of the earth. With these words, my uncle connected the room corve to the filament in the lamp. A reasonably bright light immediately dispelled the darkness of the gallery. Forward, cried my uncle, leading the way. Just as I was plunging into this dark passage, I raised my head and caught a last glimpse of that Icelandic sky which I was never to see again. The substance which formed steps under our feet had become stalactites on the walls. The lava had formed little round blisters. Crystals of opaque quartz studded with limpid tiers of glass and hanging from the ceiling like chandeliers seemed to light up as we passed. It's magnificent. What a sight, uncle. Ah, so you're beginning to appreciate all this, are you, Axel? Replied my uncle. So you consider this splendid, do you? Well, you'll see even finer sights, I hope. Now, quick march. As yet, there was no considerable rise in temperature. I consulted the thermometer and found it had only reached 10 degrees. This led me to think that our descent was more horizontal than vertical. About eight in the evening, the professor called a halt. We were in a sort of cave where there was no lack of air. On the contrary, we could feel the breezes. What atmospheric disturbance was causing them? This was a question I made no attempt to answer just then. I was utterly exhausted. The word halt was therefore music to my ears. We all ate hungrily. One thing worried me. Our stock of water was half finished. My uncle was counting on replenishing it from the underground springs, but so far we had seen no sign of any. Don't worry, Axel. I assure you that we shall find water, indeed, more than we want when we have got through this bed of lava. But this stream of lava may go down a long way. It seemed to me that we haven't got very far vertically. Well, according to my observations, we have reached a depth of 10,000 feet below sea level. Impossible. Perfectly possible. Or else figures aren't figures anymore. Indeed, the professor's calculations were correct. We had already gone 6,000 feet beyond the greatest depth hitherto reached by man. Thirtieth of June at six in the morning, we began the descent again. This went on until twelve seventeen, at which moment we caught up with Hans, who had just stopped. We were at the intersection of two roads, both of them dark and narrow. My uncle didn't wish to appear to hesitate before either me or the guide. Trusting entirely to chance, he pointed to the eastern tunnel. The slope of this new gallery was very slight, and its section extremely variable. In some places, we even had to crawl along through narrow tunnels. At six in the evening, we had gone five miles south, but barely a quarter of a mile in depth. My uncle called a halt. We ate without much conversation and went to sleep without much reflection. We awoke fresh and in good spirits and resumed our journey. I hurried after Hans, who was following my uncle. I was anxious not to be left behind. I shuddered at the thought of losing my way in this maze. At one point, where the tunnel was becoming very narrow, I leaned against the left-hand wall. When I took my hand away, it was quite black. A coal mine, I exclaimed. A mine without any miners, replied my uncle. This journey through the coal mine lasted till evening, and I was beginning to think that it would never come to an end when all of a sudden... At six o'clock, a wall appeared unexpectedly before us. To the right, to the left, above and below, there was no way through. We had come to a dead end. Well, so much the better, cried my uncle. Now at least we know where we stand. We are not on Saknusum's road, 
and there's nothing we can do but turn back. Let us take a night's rest, and in less than three days we shall be back at the place where the paths fork. Yes, I said, if we have the strength. And why shouldn't we? Because tomorrow we shall have no water left. And no courage either? I didn't dare to reply. The next day we started early in the morning. We had to hurry because we were three days' walk from the fork. Our water gave out completely at the end of the first day's march. I found the heat stifling and was paralysed with fatigue. At last, on Tuesday the 7th of July, crawling on hands and knees, we arrived half dead at the junction of the two galleries. There, I dropped like a lifeless mass stretched out on the lava floor. It was ten in the morning. After a while, my uncle came over to me and raised me in his arms. Then I saw him take the flask hanging at his side. To my amazement, he put it to my lips. Drink, he said. A mouthful of water. It's the last, you understand? The very last. Thank you, uncle. Thank you. Although my thirst had only been partially quenched, I had recovered a little of my strength. My lips were less inflamed. I found that I could speak. Look, I said, there's only one thing left for us to do. We have no water, so we must go back. We must return to Schneffels. Go back, said my uncle, and give up this expedition just when success seems assured? Never. I have begun this journey and I mean to finish it. Listen to the proposal I want to put to you. The lack of water is the only obstacle in our way. In the eastern gallery made of lava, schist and coal, we haven't found a single drop of moisture. We may be more fortunate if we follow the western tunnel. I have examined the course of that gallery. It plunges straight into the bowels of the earth, and in a few hours it will bring us to the granite mass. There we are bound to find abundant springs. I am asking you for only one day more. If, after one day, I have not found the water we need, I swear to you that we will return to the surface. The descent began again, this time by the new gallery. We hadn't gone a hundred yards before the professor, passing his lamp along the wall, cried, These are primitive rocks. Now we are on the right track. Forward! The beams from our lamps, reflected by the tiny facets of rocky mass, crisscrossed in all directions, so that I felt as if I were walking through a hollow diamond, inside which the rays were shattering against each other. About six o'clock, this festival of light abated to a noticeable extent and almost ceased. We were immured in a huge prison of granite. It was now eight in the evening, and there was still no sign of water. I was suffering agonies of thirst. My uncle strode on, listening for the murmur of some spring but there was nothing to be heard. At last, my strength gave out completely. I gave a cry and fell. Help! I'm dying! My uncle turned back. He gazed at me with his arms folded and then muttered, It's all over. The last thing I saw was a frightening gesture of rage before I closed my eyes. We had nearly four miles of the Earth's crust above us, and this mass seemed to be bearing down with all its weight on my shoulders. I felt crushed. A few hours went by. A profound silence like that of a grave reigned around us. Yet in the midst of my drowsiness, I thought I heard a noise. It seemed to me that I could see the Icelander disappearing with the lamp in his hand. I tried to shout that Hans was abandoning us, but my voice couldn't break through my parched lips. For a whole hour, my delirious brain passed in review all the reasons which might have roused our guide to action. But at last, I heard the sound of footsteps in the depths of the abyss. Hans reappeared. He went up to my uncle and gently woke him. Vatten, said the guide. Water, water, I cried. Water? repeated my uncle. Where? 
hands pointed back the way he had come. We were soon making our way down a slope of one in three. Half an hour later, we had gone a mile and a quarter and were 2,000 feet farther down. At that moment, I distinctly heard an unfamiliar sound travelling through the granite walls, a sort of dull rumbling like distant thunder. Hans was not mistaken, my uncle said. What you can hear is the roar of a torrent, there's no doubt about it. A subterranean river is flowing around us. The torrent was now roaring and leaping along inside the left-hand wall. Hans stopped at the exact spot where the torrent seemed closest to us. I could hear the water rushing past me with extreme violence about two feet away, but a granite wall still separated us from it. Hans went up to the wall. He pressed his ear against the dry stone, trying to find the exact spot where the noise of the torrent was loudest. I saw him seize his pickaxe and attack the rock. Soon the pickaxe had penetrated two feet into the granite wall. My uncle wanted to join in himself. Indeed, he had just taken hold of his pickaxe when a sudden hissing was heard. A jet of water shot out of the hole and broke against the opposite wall. The spring was scalding hot. The corridor was filling with steam and a rivulet formed and was running away downhill. Soon we were able to take our first draft. Although it was still warm, the water quickly restored our strength. What a splendid discovery Hans has made. I proposed we should give his name to this health-giving stream. And the name of Hansbach was promptly bestowed upon it. We mustn't let this water run away, I said. Let's fill the water bottle and flasks and then try to stop up the opening. No. Let's allow this water to run on. It will run downwards and will guide us as well as refresh us on our way. What a splendid idea, I exclaimed. And with this stream to help us, there's no reason why our expedition shouldn't be successful. Ah, so you're coming round to my way of thinking, my boy, said the professor. I'm not just coming round, I'm convinced. The next day, we had already forgotten all our past sufferings. Fortunately, all we had to do was descend. Let's start, Let's start. Let's I cried, start. Start. awakening with my shout the oldest echoes in the world. We set off again at eight on Thursday morning. The winding granite tunnel seemed as tortuous as a maze, but its general direction was consistently southeast. Then, all of a sudden, a frightening shaft opened at our feet. Now we shall make progress, my uncle cried. This shaft was a narrow crack in the granite mass, a fault which had obviously been caused by the contraction of the Earth's crust while it was cooling. On the 11th and 12th of July, we followed the spirals of this fault, penetrating another five miles deeper into the Earth's crust, or about 13 miles below sea level. But on the 13th, about midday, the fault took on a much gentler slope of about 45 degrees in a southeasterly direction. The path then became easy and absolutely monotonous. On Wednesday the 15th, we were 18 miles underground and about 125 miles from Schneffels. When the professor told me that we had travelled 125 miles horizontally, I couldn't help exclaiming, If your calculations are correct, we are no longer under Iceland. We have passed Cape Portland and are under the sea. Under the sea, repeated my uncle, rubbing his hands with delight. I rapidly became accustomed to the idea, for the gallery, now running straight, now winding about, but constantly heading southeast and always going deeper, soon took us to a very great depth indeed. For a few days, steep slopes, some even alarmingly close to the perpendicular, took us deep into the inner mass. Some days we advanced between four and five miles nearer to the centre. By the 7th of August, 
Our successive descents had brought us to a depth of 75 miles. We must have been then about 500 miles from Iceland. That day, the tunnel was going down a very gentle slope. Suddenly, turning around, I found that I was alone. I turned back and walked for about a quarter of an hour. I looked around but saw nobody. I called out but got no reply. I began to feel uneasy and a shiver ran down my spine. Keep calm, I said aloud to myself. I am sure to find my companions again. There's only one path after all. Seeing that I was in front, I must go back. An extraordinary silence reigned in the long gallery. I stopped. I could not bring myself to believe that I was alone. I might have gone a little astray, but I couldn't be lost. Before continuing my climb, I bent down to drink from the Hansbach. To my horror and amazement, I found that I was standing on rough, dry granite. The stream was no longer flowing at my feet. To describe my despair at that moment would be impossible, for there is no word for it in any human language. I was buried alive. In the midst of this anguish, a new terror took hold of me. My lamp had been damaged in my fall. Finally, a last gleam flickered in the lamp, and I was plunged into unfathomable darkness. At this point, I lost my head. I started dashing haphazardly through that inextricable maze, going downwards all the time, crying, shouting, yelling, bruising myself on the jagged rocks and constantly expecting to run into some wall and dash my head to pieces, until I fell headlong to the floor and fainted. I can't say how long I had been unconscious, for I no longer had any means of telling the time. Never had any human being been so isolated or forsaken as I was then. I was just about to lose consciousness again, when a loud noise struck my ears. It was like a roll of thunder, and I could hear the sound waves gradually fading away in the distant depths of the abyss. Again silence reigned in the gallery. All of a sudden, my ear, which happened to be resting against the wall, caught the sound of words. Indistinguishable and remote, but nonetheless, words. I cried out. Help! Help! I listened, straining my ears for some reply from the darkness. A shout, or even a sigh. Moving my ear about over the wall, I found a place where the voices seemed to sound most clearly. No. I said, no, it isn't through the rock that these voices are reaching me. Some peculiar acoustic effect is conducting this noise along the gallery. I listened once more, and this time I distinctly heard my name. There was no time to lose. If my uncle moved even a few steps away, the acoustic effect would be destroyed. I therefore drew close to the wall, and speaking as clearly as possible said... Uncle Lidenbrock. I waited in extreme anxiety. A few seconds which seemed like centuries went by, and at last... Axel! Where are you, my boy? Lost in complete darkness. Another long pause. Then I heard my uncle's voice again. Courage! Listen to me. Thinking you were still somewhere on the hand's back... We came back, firing our guns. Now our voices can meet, though our hands cannot touch. But don't despair. I have calculated that it takes 20 seconds for your voice to reach us. So we are just under four miles apart. Cheer up, Axel. That's not an impossible distance. But should I go up or down? Again, I waited for the answer. Down! We are in a huge cavern with a great many galleries leading into it. And the one you are in is sure to bring you here. I therefore set off. The slope was quite steep and I let myself slide. Soon the speed of my descent increased at an alarming rate until it began to be more of a fall. 
All of a sudden, the ground disappeared from under my feet. I felt myself falling down a vertical shaft. I lost consciousness. When I came to, my uncle was watching my face for some sign of life. He's alive. He's alive. My dear boy, you are saved. Uncle, tell me where we are. Tomorrow, Axel, tomorrow. Sleep now, and tomorrow I will tell you everything. It really is a miracle that you weren't killed. For heaven's sake, don't ever let us get separated again. Not get separated again? Then the expedition wasn't over. I opened my eyes wide in astonishment. What's the matter, Axel? I must be mad. I can see daylight. And I can hear the wind blowing and the sea breaking on the shore. Let's go out. I need an explanation. No, Axel. The open air might be bad for you. The open air? Yes, the wind is rather strong. I don't want you to risk going out in it. A relapse would cause us a lot of trouble and we have no time to lose, for the voyage may be a long one. The voyage? Yes. Rest today and tomorrow we'll set sail. Set sail? My curiosity was aroused to fever pitch. When my uncle saw that my impatience was likely to do me more harm than the satisfaction of my curiosity, he let me out. When my eyes became accustomed to the light, I was astounded. The power of this light was unlike the splendor of our own sunshine, nor the pale glow of moonlight. Its clear, brilliant whiteness indicated an electrical origin. It was like an aurora borealis. The sea! I cried. Yes, said my uncle. The Lidenbrock Sea. For I don't imagine that any other explorer is likely to dispute my claim to having discovered it. A vast sheet of water stretched away out of sight. It was a real sea, but utterly deserted and horribly wild in appearance. We were indeed imprisoned inside a huge cavern. It was impossible to gauge its width, since the shore stretched away on either side as far as the eye could see, or its length, for our gaze was soon halted by a somewhat indefinite horizon. As for the clouds, I put their height at about 12,000 feet. After an imprisonment of over 40 days in a narrow gallery, it was sheer bliss to breathe this moist, salty air. 500 yards away, at the end of a steep promontory, a tall, dense forest appeared. It consisted of trees of medium height, shaped like parasols, with sharp geometrical outlines. The wind seemed to have no effect on their foliage. And in the midst of the gusts, they remained motionless, like a group of petrified cedars. They were white mushrooms, 30 or 40 feet high, with heads of an equal diameter. There were thousands of them. The light couldn't penetrate, and complete darkness reigned between these domes. Farther on, a great many other trees with colorless foliage stood in groups. They were easy to recognize as the lowly shrubs of the earth, grown to phenomenal dimensions. Astonishing! Magnificent! Splendid! cried my uncle. Here, we have the entire flora of the secondary period of the world, the transitional period. Here are our humble garden plants, which were trees in the early ages of the globe. It is a hothouse, but it may be a menagerie too. Look at this dust we are walking on. These bones scattered on the ground are the bones of antediluvian animals. Here is the lower jaw of a mastodon. And there is a femur, which can only have belonged to the biggest of all those monsters, the megatherium. But uncle, I can't understand the presence of such huge quadrupeds in this granite cavern. Well, Axel, there is a very simple answer. This soil is alluvial. Probably subsidences of the Earth's crust occurred, and some of the alluvial soil was carried to the bottom of the abysses, which suddenly opened up. But if antediluvian animals have lived in these subterranean regions, how do we know that some of those monsters are not still roaming around? I examined the various points of the horizon, but no living creature could be seen on those deserted shores. It seemed that we were the only living creatures in this subterranean world. A whole succession of questions rose to my lips. Where did the sea end? Where did it lead? 
could we ever hope to reach its opposite shores? My uncle had no doubt that we could. I was torn between hope and fear. The next morning, I was feeling completely recovered. After breakfast, we were walking on the sandy beach and the waves were gradually moving up the shore. Now, said my uncle, the tide is rising and we must not miss the opportunity of studying this phenomenon. Uncle, who would ever have imagined that inside the Earth's crust there was a real ocean with ebbing and flowing tides, winds and storms? Why shouldn't these waters contain fish of some unknown species? Let's make some lines and hooks and see if they will have as much success down here as up above. We will try, Axel, for we must penetrate all the secrets of these newly discovered regions. But where are we, Uncle? Horizontally, we are 875 miles from Iceland. As far as that? I am sure I am not more than a mile out. And how deep down are we? 88 miles. So, I said, examining the map. The mountainous part of Scotland is above us. The Grampians are raising their snow-covered peaks at an incredible height over our heads. Yes, replied the professor. It's rather a heavy weight to carry, but the ceiling is solid. I'm not afraid of the roof caving in, I said. But what are your plans? Aren't you thinking of returning to the surface of the earth? Seeing that everything has gone so well so far, we shall continue our journey. But I don't see how we're going to get down below this liquid plain. On the opposite shore must lie the entrance to our next descent. There's no time to lose. We set sail tomorrow. But what about a boat? It won't be a boat, my boy, but a good solid raft. Hans is already at work. Building a raft? Yes. Come and look. A half-finished draft was lying on the sand. The next evening, the raft was finished. The beams of fossil wood bound together by strong ropes formed a solid surface. And once launched, this improvised vessel floated peacefully on the waters of the Lidenbrock Sea. The provisions, baggage, instruments, arms and a large amount of fresh water were put on board. And at six o'clock, the professor gave the order to embark. Just as we were leaving the little harbour, my uncle suggested giving it a name. I have a name to propose to you, I said. Grauben. Port Grauben. Port Grauben it shall be, conceded the professor magnanimously. The wind was blowing from the northwest. We sailed before it at great speed. After an hour, my uncle had been able to calculate our speed. If we go on at this rate, he said, we shall cover at least 75 miles in 24 hours, and it won't be long before we reach the opposite shore. As soon as we had left Port Graven, my uncle had instructed me to keep the log. Friday, 14th of August. Coast 75 miles to leeward. Weather, fine. 32 degrees centigrade. At midday, Hans fastened a hook at the end of a line, baited it with a small piece of meat, and threw it into the sea. For two hours we caught nothing, and we began to think that these waters were uninhabited. But then there was a pull at the line. Hans drew it in and brought a struggling fish out of the water. My uncle noted after a brief examination that the fish belonged to the family of the Cephalisphides, which had long been extinct. In two hours, we caught a considerable quantity of Terictis, as well as some fish belonging to another extinct family, the Dipterides. None of them had eyes. Now my imagination carried me away among the wonderful hypotheses of paleontology, and I had a prehistoric daydream. I could see floating on the water some huge Chersites, antediluvian tortoises like floating islands. Along the dark shore, there passed the great mammals of early times, the Leptotherium, found in the caves of Brazil, and the Merikotherium, found in the icy regions of Siberia. Farther on, 
the Pachydermatus lophiodon, a gigantic tapir, was hiding behind the rocks, ready to dispute its prey with the Anoplotherium, a strange amalgam of rhinoceros, horse, hippopotamus and camel. The giant mastodon waved its trunk and pounded the rocks on the shore with its tusks, while the megatherium buttressed on its enormous legs, burrowed in the earth, rousing the echoes of the granite rocks with its roars. Higher up, the Protopithica, the first monkey to appear on Earth, was climbing the steep peaks. Higher still, the pterodactyl with its winged claws glided like a huge bat through the dense air. And finally, in the upper strata of the atmosphere soared enormous birds, more powerful than the cassowary and bigger than the ostrich. The whole of this fossil world came to life again in my imagination. Then my dream took me even further back into the ages before the appearance of living creatures. The mammals disappeared, then the birds, then the reptiles of a secondary period, and finally the fishes, crustaceans, mollusks, and articulated creatures. Centuries passed by like days. I went back through the long series of terrestrial changes. The plants disappeared. The granite rocks softened. Solid matter turned to liquid under the action of intense heat. Water covered the surface of the globe, boiling and volatilizing. Steam enveloped the earth, which gradually turned into a gaseous mass, white hot, as big and as bright as the sun. In the center of this nebula, which was 1,400,000 times as large as the globe it would one day form, I was carried through interplanetary space. An hallucination had taken hold of me. My body was volatilized in its turn and mingled like an imponderable atom with these vast vapors tracing their flaming orbits through infinity. Have you gone mad? cried the professor. What is it? Are you ill? No. I've had a brief hallucination, but it's over now. Is everything all right? Yes. There's a fair wind and a fine sea. We are making good headway. And unless my calculations are wrong, we shall soon make land. Saturday, the 15th of August. My head was still dazed by the vivid impression made by my dream. My uncle was in a bad temper. You seem anxious, uncle. I've good reason to be. But we're going very fast. What's the good of that? It isn't our speed that's too small, but the sea that's too big. I remembered that before we set sail, the professor had estimated the length of this subterranean sea at about 75 miles. But we'd already covered three times that distance, and there was still no sign of the southern shore. And we aren't going down, the professor went on. I didn't come all this way just to go for an outing on a pond. But, I said, we followed the course indicated by Saknussen. That's just the point. Have we followed that route? Did Saknussen meet this stretch of water? Did he cross it? Has that stream we took as a guide led us astray? My uncle took soundings. Tying one of the heaviest pickaxes to the end of a cord, which he let down 200 fathoms. No bottom. When the pickaxe was back on board, hands showed me some deep imprints on its surface. They were definitely the marks of teeth. The jaws which contained them must have been incredibly powerful. I couldn't take my eyes off the bar which had been half gnawed away. We must keep a sharp lookout. Tuesday, 18th of August. Evening came. Hans was at the tiller. During his watch, I fell asleep. Two hours later, a violent shock awoke me. The raft had been lifted up above the water with indescribable force and hurled a hundred feet or more. What's the matter? cried my uncle. Have we run aground? Hans pointed to a dark mass rising and falling about a quarter of a mile away. It's a colossal porpoise, I cried. Yes, shouted the professor. And there's an enormous sea lizard. And look, 
Beyond that, a monstrous crocodile. Look at its huge jaws and its rows of teeth. Oh, it's disappearing. And now a whale, a whale. They stood there, stupefied by this herd of marine monsters. They were of supernatural dimensions, and the smallest of them could have broken the raft with one snap of its jaws. Hans wanted to put up the helm to get away from this dangerous region. But in the other direction, he saw more enemies, which were just as terrifying. A turtle 40 feet long and a giant serpent darting its enormous head to and fro above the waves. The reptiles came nearer and circled around the raft at great speed. We were speechless with fright. They drew closer, the crocodile on one side, the serpent on the other. The rest of the herd had disappeared. The two monsters passed within a hundred yards of the raft and hurled themselves on one another with a fury which fortunately prevented them from seeing us. The battle began. We could distinctly see the two monsters at grips with each other. The first of those monsters had the snout of a porpoise, the head of a lizard and the teeth of a crocodile. It's the most formidable of the antediluvian reptiles, the Ichthyosaurus, explained the professor. The other is a serpent with a turtle shell and the mortal enemy of the first, the Pesiosaurus. These two animals attacked each other with indescribable fury. They raised mountainous waves which rolled as far as the raft, so that a score of times we were on the point of capsizing. Hissing noises of tremendous intensity reached our ears. Suddenly, the Ichthyosaurus and the Plesiosaurus disappeared, creating a positive whirlpool in the water. Several minutes passed. All of a sudden, an enormous head shot out of the water, the head of the Plesiosaurus. The monster was mortally wounded. I could no longer see its huge shell, but just its long neck, rising, falling, coiling and uncoiling lashing and writhing, the blood spurting all around. But soon, the reptile's death agony drew to an end. Its movements grew less violent, its contortions became feebler, and the long serpentine form stretched out, an inert mass on the calm waves. Victorious, the Ichthyosaurus returned to its submarine cave. Friday, August 21st. I calculated we had sailed 675 miles from Port Grauben and were 1,500 miles from Iceland, under England. The weather was about to change. The atmosphere grew heavy. The clouds were full of electricity. My own body was saturated with it and my hair was standing on end as if it were close to an electrical machine. The professor was in a dreadful temper at seeing the ocean stretching away into infinity before his eyes. We are going to have a storm, he said. There was a general silence. The wind dropped completely. Let's reef the sail, I said. No, damn it, no, cried my uncle. Let the storm carry us away. Provided I set eyes on a rocky shore, I don't care if it smashes our raft to smithereens. These words were scarcely out of his mouth before the accumulated vapours condensed into water and the air blew with hurricane force. The raft rose into the air and bounded forward. My eyes were dazzled by the intensity of the light, my ears deafened by the din of thunder. I had to cling to the mast which bent like a reed before the violence of the storm. Sunday, August the 23rd. Where are we? We've been carried along with indescribable rapidity. Last night was dreadful, and the storm has not abated. We are living in a continuous din and uproar. Our ears are bleeding, and it's hardly possible to exchange a word. Where are we going? My uncle is stretched out at full length at the end of the raft. It is getting hotter. Monday, August the 24th. We are utterly worn out. At midday, the storm increased in violence, and the waves were washing over our heads. My uncle shouted, We are done for. Lower the sail, I yelled back. He was nodding in agreement when a ball of fire appeared on board.
the mast and sail vanished together. I saw them rising to a prodigious height. The fireball, half white, half blue, and the size of a ten inch shell, moved across the raft slowly, but revolving at an astonishing speed under the lash of the hurricane. For a horrible moment, I thought we were going to be blown up as the dazzling ball approached. Hans simply stared at it, but my uncle fell to his knees to avoid it. It pirouetted towards my foot, which I tried to pull away, but in vain. A smell of nitrous gas filled the air. Why was I unable to move my foot? Then I realized that the electric fireball had magnetized all the iron on board. The nails of my boots were clinging to an iron plate. At last, with a violent effort, I managed to pull my foot away, just as the ball was going to seize it in its gyrations and carry me away. Suddenly there was a blaze of light. The ball had burst and we were covered with tongues of fire. Then everything went dark. Where are we going? Tuesday, August the 25th. The storm is still raging. We are still at sea, moving at an incalculable speed. We have passed under England, under the Channel, under France, perhaps under the whole of Europe. I can hear a new noise. Surely it's the sound of a sea breaking on rocks. I felt myself being flung into the sea, but the brave Icelander carried me out of reach of the waves to a hot sandy beach where I found myself lying beside my uncle. The next day, the weather was magnificent. The sky and sea had calmed down with one accord. Every trace of a storm had disappeared. Well, my boy? inquired the professor. Have you slept well? You seem in very good spirits this morning, uncle. Delighted, my boy, delighted. We've arrived. At the end of our expedition? No, but at the end of that apparently endless sea. Now we can really plunge into the bowels of the earth. What about our return journey? You mean to say you are still thinking about the return journey before we've even arrived? No, no. I only want to know how, how we're going to manage it. In the simplest way possible. Once we have reached the centre of the globe, we shall either find some new route to the surface or we shall return in a very humdrum fashion by the way we have come. I don't imagine that it will close up behind us. Then we shall have to repair the raft. Of course. What about the instruments? Have they survived the storm? Yes. Here is the manometer, the most useful of all, and there's the compass in perfect condition, as well as the chronometer and the thermometers. What about the provisions? I asked. For the most part, the sea has spared them. We have enough food for another four months. We have time to get there and back. During breakfast, I asked the professor where he thought we were. At our last observation, we were over 1,500 miles from Iceland. Count four days of storm, during which our rate cannot have been less than 200 miles every 24 hours. If our calculations are correct, we have now got the Mediterranean over our heads. We can't say for sure that we are under the Mediterranean and not under Turkey or the Atlantic, unless we are certain that our direction has not changed. We can easily find out by consulting the compass. He was cheerful, rubbing his hands and striking attitudes. I followed him, curious. My uncle took the compass and examined the needle, which after a few oscillations took up a fixed position. He turned to me in amazement. The north tip of the needle is pointing to what we suppose to be the south. It's pointing inland instead of out to sea. There seemed to be no doubt that during the storm a sudden change of wind had occurred which we hadn't noticed and had brought the raft back to the shore which my uncle thought we had left behind us. 
So, fate is having fun with me, is it? Air, fire and water combine to block my way. Well, I won't give in. I won't move back an inch. And we shall see whether man or nature will get the upper hand. Listen to me, I said firmly. We are ill-equipped for a sea voyage. We should be mad to try that impossible crossing a second time. To the raft, he cried. It was no use arguing. Hans had just finished repairing the raft, as if that strange creature had guessed my uncle's intentions. The professor said a few words to the guide, who promptly placed all our effects on board and got ready to cast off. We shan't leave till tomorrow, the professor said. Since fate has driven me onto this part of the coast, I won't leave it until I have explored it. And leaving hands at his work, we set off. We had followed the shores of the Lidenbrock Sea for a mile when the ground suddenly changed in appearance. It looked as if it had been shaken and convulsed by a violent upheaval of the lower strata. We were advancing with difficulty over granite fragments mingled with flint, quartz and alluvial deposits when we were suddenly confronted with a field, or rather a plain, covered with bones. It looked like a huge cemetery. Great mounds of bones were piled up in row after row, stretching away to the horizon where they disappeared into the mist. I was stupefied, and my uncle's whole attitude denoted utter astonishment. He was faced with a priceless collection of Leptotheria, Medicatheria, Lephidia, Anoplotheria, Megatheria, Mastodons, Protopithecae, Pterodactyls and other antediluvian monsters, all heaped up there for his personal satisfaction. A moment later, sifting through all this organic dust, he picked up a skull and cried out, Axel! Axel! Look! A human head! His joy and stupefaction knew no bounds when a few yards further on, he found himself face to face with a specimen of quaternary man. It was an entirely recognisable and perfectly preserved human corpse. Taut, parchment-like skin, limbs still covered with flesh, perfect teeth, abundant hair, and fearfully long nails on fingers and toes. It was indeed an astonishing sight, that spectacle of generations of men and animals mingled together in a common cemetery. But then a serious question occurred to us. Had these creatures slipped through a fissure in the earth to the shores of the Lidenbrock Sea when they were already dead? Or had they lived here, in this subterranean world, under this false sky, being born and dying like the inhabitants of the upper earth? So far, only sea monsters and fishes had appeared to us alive. Might not some human being, some native of the abyss, still be roaming these desolate shores? For another half hour, we walked over these layers of bones, impelled by our burning curiosity. What other marvels did this cavern contain? After walking a mile, we reached the edge of a huge forest. But this time, not one of those forests of mushrooms which we had seen near Port Grauben. My uncle plunged boldly into this gigantic thicket. Suddenly, I stopped short, holding my uncle back. I thought I had seen some huge shapes moving about beneath the trees. Sure enough, it was a herd of gigantic mastodons. Not fossils this time, but living creatures. I saw those huge elephants whose trunks were twisting about under the trees like a legion of serpents. We were alone in the bowels of the earth, at the mercy of its fierce inhabitants. Come along, Uncle said, seizing me by the arm. Forward, forward! No, I cried. No human being could brave the anger of those monsters. You are wrong, Axel. Look. Look over there. Less than a quarter of a mile away stood a human being watching over that great herd of mastodons. He was a giant capable of mastering those monsters. He was over 12 feet tall. His head, which was as big as a buffalo's, was half hidden in the tangled growth of his unkempt hair. Come on! Come on! I cried, pulling my uncle, who for the first time in his life allowed himself to be persuaded. 
A quarter of an hour later, we were out of sight of that formidable figure. Although I was certain that we were treading grounds on which we had not set foot before, I kept noticing groups of rocks whose shapes reminded me of those at Port Grauben. This, of course, seemed to confirm the indication given by the compass that we had involuntarily returned to the north coast of the Lidenbrock Sea. I told my uncle about my bewilderment. Obviously, I said to him, we haven't landed at our point of departure, but the storm has carried us a little further down. We must be near the little port. Perhaps, Axel, but we should at least find our own traces, and I can see nothing. But I can, I replied. This. And I showed my uncle a rusty dagger which I had just picked up. The professor examined it and exclaimed, This dagger is a 16th century weapon. It belongs neither to you, nor to me, nor to our guide. Axel, we are on the way to a great discovery. This blade has remained on the sand here for one, two, three hundred years. Somebody's been here before us, I cried. Yes, a man. A man who wants to indicate the way to the centre of the earth. Let's look around. Presently, we reached a place where the beach narrowed. The sea almost came up to the foot of the cliffs, leaving a passage no wider than a couple of yards. Between two projecting rocks we caught sight of the entrance to a dark tunnel. There, on a slab of granite, appeared two mysterious letters, half eaten away by time, the two initials of the bold, adventurous traveller, A.S. A.S., cried my uncle. Arne Saknusum! I was already rushing towards the dark tunnel when the professor stopped me. Let's go back to Hans first, he said and bring the raft to this spot. Axel, everything has worked out for the best. We are leaving this horizontal sea which couldn't lead us anywhere. Now we shall go down and down and down. Do you realise that we're less than 4,000 miles from the centre now? Is that all? I cried. Why, that's nothing. Let's fetch the raft. Everything was ready for an immediate start. There was not a single package that hadn't been put on board. We took our places on the raft, the sail was hoisted, and Hans set his course along the coast for Cape Saknusum. Often the rocks, which were just below the surface of the water, forced us to make fairly long detours. Finally, after three hours at sea, we reached the place where we could disembark near the tunnel. The raft was moored to the shore. The opening, roughly circular, was about five feet across. The dark tunnel plunged straight into the rock. We were following an almost horizontal course when, after about half a dozen paces, our progress was barred by a huge rock. Damn this rock! I cried angrily. We searched in vain to right and left, up and down, for a way through. There was no chink. I sat down on the ground. My uncle strode up and down the passage. But what about Saknusum? I cried. Yes, said my uncle. Does this mean he was stopped by this stone barrier? No, no, I exclaimed. This piece of rock must have been loosened by some shock or by one of those magnetic storms which affect these regions. It's an accidental obstacle which Saknusum didn't meet. If we don't destroy it, we are unworthy to reach the centre of the earth. Well, said my uncle, let's make our way through with our pickaxes. Pickaxes would take too long. What then? Why, gun cotton, of course. Let's blow it up. Hands to work, cried my uncle. The Icelander returned to the raft and soon came back with a pickaxe which he used to hollow out a hole for the charge. By midnight, the charge of gun cotton was packed inside the hollow and the fuse wound its way along the gallery to a point just outside. One spark would now be enough to set off the whole contraption. Tomorrow, said the professor. I had no option but to resign myself to waiting another six long hours.
The next day, Thursday the 27th of August, was a great date in our subterranean journey. I can't recall it now without feeling my heart beating with fear. From that time on, our reason, judgment and ingenuity counted for nothing, and we became the playthings of the elements. The time had come to blast our way through the granite obstruction. I begged for the honour of lighting the fuse. Once I had done this, I was to join my companions on the raft. We were to put out to sea to avoid the dangers of the explosion. Off you go, my boy, said my uncle, and come back and join us straight away. Don't worry, I replied. I won't stop to play. I promptly went to the mouth of the tunnel, opened my lantern and picked up the end of the fuse. The professor was holding his chronometer in his hand. Ready? he called out. Yes, I'm ready. Well then, fire, my boy. I ignited the fuse and ran back to the water's edge. Come on board, said my uncle. Hands, push off. Another five minutes. Another four. Another three. My pulse was beating half seconds. Another two. One. Now, you granite mountains, down you go. The shape of the rock suddenly changed before my eyes. They opened like a curtain. I caught sight of a bottomless pit which appeared in the very shore. The sea, seized with a fit of giddiness, turned into a single enormous wave, on the ridge of which the raft stood up perpendicular. All three of us were thrown flat on our faces. In less than a second, the light was replaced by total darkness. In spite of the darkness, noise, surprise and terror, I realised what had happened. On the other side of the rock, which had just blown up, the explosion had caused a sort of earthquake. An abyss had opened up, and the sea was pouring into it, carrying us with it. We hung on to each other to save ourselves from being thrown off the raft. This was undoubtedly the way Saknusum had come, but instead of following it by ourselves, we had, by our imprudence, brought a whole sea along with us. The water was falling at an angle steeper than that of the swiftest rapids in America. The raft was occasionally caught by an eddy and spun round as it raced along. Then I made a discovery which complicated matters. I found that most of the objects which we had taken on board had disappeared at the moment of the explosion when the sea had struck us so violently. Only the compass and the chronometer remained, and we had only one day's provisions left. I thought to tell my uncle everything, to show him the terrible straits to which we were reduced, to calculate exactly how much longer we had to live. But I had the courage to remain silent. I wanted to leave him cool and self-possessed. After a fairly long interval, our speed increased, as I noticed from the wind in my face. The descent became steeper, and I really believed that we were no longer gliding but falling. I had the impression of an almost vertical drop. My uncle and Hans held me firmly by the arms. Suddenly, after a lapse of time, I felt a shock. The raft had not collided with a solid object, but its fall had suddenly been arrested. A water spout, a huge liquid column struck its surface, and I felt as if I was suffocating, drowning. At this moment, silence fell in the gallery, taking the place of the roar which had filled my ears for hours. Then my uncle murmured, We are going up. Yes, we are going up. We are going up. We are rising fast. We are in a narrow shaft. The water has reached the bottom of the abyss and is now rising to find its own level, taking us with it. Where to? We must be ready for anything. Our situation is almost desperate. But there are a few chances of our escaping. If we may die at any moment, we may also be saved at any moment. The temperature was rising at an alarming rate, and at that moment it must have stood at about 40 centigrade. If we are neither drowned nor crushed, and if we don't starve to death, we may still manage to be burnt alive, I said. The professor simply shrugged his shoulders. He was carefully examining the nature of the terrain, torch in hand, trying to discover where he was from observation of a strata. Eruptive granite, he said. We are still in the primitive period. Good. Soon we shall come to the terrain of the transition period, and then... Meanwhile, the temperature was rising fast. Are we going up towards a furnace? No, that's impossible. Impossible. All the same, this wall is burning hot and the water is boiling. 
This time, the professor's only answer was an angry gesture. In the flickering light of a torch, I noticed some convulsive movement in the layers of granite. A phenomenon was obviously going to take place in which electricity would play some part. And then there was this unbearable heat, this boiling water. I decided to consult the compass. It had gone mad. The needle was swinging jerkily from one pole to the other, indicating every point of the compass in turn, and spinning round as if it were giddy. Then the maddened compass, shaken by the electrical phenomena, confirmed me in my opinion. The mineral crust was threatening to burst. Uncle! Uncle! I cried. We are done for! Look at these shaking walls! This crazy needle, it's, it's an earthquake! An earthquake? No, I'm expecting something better than that. What do you mean? An eruption, Axel. An eruption? You mean you think we are in the shaft of an active volcano? I do, and I think it's the best thing that could happen to us. But we're caught in the midst of an eruption, I exclaimed. Fate has flung us in the path of burning lava, molten rock, boiling water. We're going to be thrown out, expelled, rejected, vomited, spat into the air. And you say that's the best thing that could happen to us? Yes, because it's the only chance we have of returning to the surface of the Earth. It was obvious that we were being carried upwards by an eruptive thrust. We were in the chimney of a volcano. An enormous force was pushing us irresistibly upwards. I have no clear recollection of what happened during the following hours but just a vague impression of continuous explosion, shifting rocks, and a spinning movement in which our raft was whirled around. It rocked about on waves of lava, in the midst of a rain of ashes, roaring flames enveloped it. I caught a glimpse of Ham's face in the light of the flames, and after that, the only feeling I had was like the terror of a condemned man tied to the mouth of a cannon, just as a shot is fired and his limbs are scattered to the winds. When I opened my eyes again, I found myself lying on a mountain slope only a few feet from an abyss. Where are we? asked my uncle, who seemed to be extremely annoyed at being back on the surface of the earth. In Iceland, I said. It certainly doesn't look like Iceland. This isn't a northern volcano with granite slopes and a skull cap of snow, said the professor. After the countless surprises of our journey, one more had been reserved for us. Contrary to all our expectations, we were lying halfway down a mountain under a scorching sun. Above our heads, not more than 500 feet up, there was a volcano, through which, every quarter of an hour, with a loud explosion, there emerged a tall column of flame mingled with pumice stone, ashes and lava. Its base was hidden in a regular bower of green trees, among which I made out olives, figs and vines laden with purple grapes. The professor said, Whatever this mountain may be, it's rather hot here. Let's go down the mountain and find out where we are. I think we're in Asia, I replied. Or on the Indian coast. Or the Malay archipelago. Or Oceania. We might have gone right across the globe and come out of the antipodes of Europe. What about the compass? asked my uncle. According to the compass, we have been travelling north all the time, I replied. There was a mystery here, and I didn't know what to think. After two hours walking, we reached a lovely stretch of country, entirely covered with olive trees, pomegranate trees, and vines which seemed to be common property. What a joy it was to press that delicious fruit to our lips and to bite off whole clusters of those purple grapes. While we were enjoying these delights, a child appeared between two clumps of olive trees. Just as the boy was about to take to his heels, my uncle, doing his best to reassure him, asked him, What is the name of this mountain, my boy? The child made no reply. Good, said my uncle. We are not in Germany. He then put the same question in English. The child didn't answer. Is the boy dumb? cried the professor, and repeated the same question in French. 
the same silence. Then let's try Italian. Come si nome questa isola? Stromboli, replied the little shepherd boy. Oh, what a journey. What a wonderful journey. We had gone in by one volcano and come out by another, and this other was more than 3,000 miles from Schneffels. The chances of our expedition had carried us into the heart of the most beautiful part of the world. We had exchanged the region of perpetual snow for that of infinite verdure, and the grey fog of the icy north for the blue skies of Sicily. But the compass, the compass, it pointed north. How can we explain that fact? I cannot hope to describe Martha's astonishment and Grauben's joy at our return. Now that you are a hero, Axel, my dear fiancé said to me, you will never need to leave me again. I looked at her, and she smiled through her tears. Our journey to the centre of the earth created a tremendous sensation all over the world. One aspect of the journey, the behaviour of the compass, remained a mystery, and for a scientist, an unexplained phenomenon is torture. Fortunately, Providence was to make my uncle completely happy. One day, while arranging a collection of minerals in his study, I noticed the famous compass and had a look at it. Suddenly I gave a cry of surprise. What's the matter? he asked. The compass. Well? Well, the needle points south instead of north. What's that you say? Look! The poles are reversed. Reversed? Light dawned at the same time in his mind as mine. So, after our arrival at Cape Sacknussen, the needle of this confounded compass pointed south instead of north, he exclaimed. Obviously, I said. Then that explains our mistake. But what phenomenon could have caused this reversal of the poles? It's all very simple. Explain yourself, my boy. During the storm on the Lidenbrock Sea, that fireball which magnetised all the iron on the raft simply reversed the poles of our compass. Ha ha! Ha ha! cried the professor. So it was a practical joke that electricity played on us. From that day onward, I was the happiest of men. For my pretty Grauben abdicated her position as ward and took her place in the Königstrasse house in the dual capacity of niece and wife. I need scarcely add that her uncle was the illustrious Professor Otto Lidenbrock, corresponding member of all the scientific, geographical and mineralogical societies in the world. Axel! Axel! Follow me!